Hello, everyone. My name is Kostas Kidaniatis, and I'll be your instructor for the College Algebra Online course. I'll be posting recitation videos. During those videos, unless specifically mentioned, I will assume that you have already watched the lecture videos and the formulas to solve the exercise are already familiar to you. Today, we'll go over the first set of homework. I will be doing throughout our sessions the even number problems and you'll be expected to submit the odd number problems. So I'll start with problem two. For problem two, we are asked to find the intersection of the two following intervals and have it on both the notation of the number line and the interval notation. The interval that we have is minus four to seven, where the seven is included. Intersection one, Two, five. Now, the way I recommend to calculating those is you start with a number line notation, you get your answer there, and then you proceed with the interval notation. So let's create a number line that includes at least those four numbers that are in our intervals. Minus four, one, five, and seven. As long as we put them in the right order, the spacing between them does not really affect us. So we have minus four, one, five, and seven. Now, I will above the line represent one of the intervals. I'll start with minus four to seven. So minus four goes from here. all the way up to here and include seven. And the second interval that I have, it is one till five, including one, but not five. Okay, now that we have those two together above and below our line, the way to calculate the answer for the intersection is to see that which part of the line is covered by both of them. So for example, here below minus four, neither of the red nor the green line would overlap if we move it on top of the number line. So this is not a part of our answer. Between minus four and one, we only have the red line covering it. So this is not a part of our answer. Remember intersection is the set that includes the numbers that are all in the sets mentioned here, both in the set minus four to seven and to one till five. So I need both lines to cover an interval. Same goes for between five and seven. This is covered only by the red line, so it's not part of my answer. And anything above seven, it is not covered by neither of the lines. So what remains here, it is the interval between one and five. And that is indeed covered by both the green line and the red line. So this is our answer. The last thing remaining to do here is to see if the endpoints one and five are included in my set. Now the endpoint one, it is included in the red line because it is covered by it. It's not an endpoint of the line and hence included to it. For the green line, it is an endpoint that included. Remember in the lecture videos, the, it is mentioned that if we have a bracket at the end point, we include that point. If we have a parenthesis, we don't. Hence one is included in the green set and it is included in the green in the red set. So it is included in the intersection. Now for five, it is still included in the red set since it is within the line, but it is not included in the green set because it is on a parenthesis end point. Hence, this is not being included in our intersection either. And this is the numbered line answer. Now, to formulate the interval answer, you just rewrite the endpoints as you have them with the corresponding symbols and a comma in between them. So the endpoint one will have a bracket and the endpoint five will have a parenthesis and we separate them with a comma. That is all for problem two. Let's proceed with exercise four. For this one, we have an intersection instead of a union. 
the intersection is the set that includes any number in the sets involved in it. So here, our example, it is the, inter the union of minus infinity, comma four, and one comma six, with four and one being closed, being included. As in the previous one, we will start with the number line. Now, infinity is a special case. If it is as minus infinity, we just put it on the leftmost part of our number line. And if it is a plus infinity, I'll just notate it here, even though we don't need it, we put it in the rightmost part of our number line. The rest are just numbers, and we put them in a number line, same as before. The spacing between them does not really matter, but the order does. So we have one, we have four, and six. Same as before, we will be drawing the two intervals separately. I'll start with the interval minus infinity till four and rotate it above with a, num with a red line. I include four and I have a parenthesis at minus infinity. Another thing to point out here is that whenever an interval involves infinity, it will always be with a parenthesis and never with a bracket. So in case we are wondering, should we include or not include infinity, we will never include it. Infinity, it is not a real number after all. And this is intersection and unions of real numbers. We'll notate from below with a green, the interval one to six. Now, for our answer, the union, it is any part of the number line that it is covered from at least one of our lines. So from minus infinity until one, we do have this part because it is covered by the red line. From one to four, we do have this part because it is covered by both the green and the red line. And from four to six, we do include this because it is covered by the green line. Now, six and above, it is not included. It is not part of our answer because neither line would cover it if we move them on our number line. Now, as far as which parts are included on the endpoints, as mentioned earlier, infinity will never be included. So here we will have a parenthesis. And six, it is an open point or on our green set. It is with a parenthesis, so it is not included either. And six is not at all in the red set, of course. Here we have the answer in the number line. And in order to have the answer in the interval notation, we have minus infinity with a parenthesis. It is an infinity. It will always be with a parenthesis. Comma six with a parenthesis. For the reason mentioned above, it is not included in our set. The next one asks us to find the midpoint and the distance between two given points. Let's name them point A with coordinates minus six over five, comma two, and point B with coordinates one comma one third. Now, I will be referring to the coordinate, the X coordinate of point A as XA, and the y coordinate of point A as YA. And similarly for point B, I will referring as XB and YB. The formula for the distance as provided in the lecture notes, it is the difference between the X coordinates of the two points squared plus the difference of the Y coordinates squared and their sum under a square root. So here we start plugging in the numbers we have. We have minus six over five minus one squared plus two minus one third squared. This gives us 11 over five squared plus five over three squared and their sum under a square root. 
and plugging those two into a calculator. Remember, in this course, you are allowed to use a calculator to simplify stuff, as long as the calculator cannot plot functions. And you are also allowed to use calculators in an exam. So things like a distance of two points where we are expected to get numbers that are not easy to simplify, even if they can be simplified, are things that you are expected to use your calculator. When you arrive to the point here that I've written square root of 1714 over 225, you can leave your answer there, as long as it is something that cannot be easily or immediately simplified, like square root of one or square root of four, you are not expected to simplify it. If you had to plug it into a calculator, it might give you back this, which is a perfectly fine answer as well. The answer in decimals are acceptable. They're not necessary though. So if you have already done some calculations, you are under the square root and you have just one fraction, you can leave your answer as such. Now, for the midpoint, we have a different formula. The formula for the midpoint as given in the lecture notes, it is the sum of the x coordinates over two, comma, the sum of the y coordinates over two. So in another instance, we have the coordinate minus six over five, plus the coordinate for B is one, and we divide the sum of those two by two. And then we have the Y coordinate for the first point being two, the Y coordinate for the second point being one third, and we divide those by two. Again, some things can be plugged into a calculator. When you do that, make sure this comma is not something you plug in your calculator as to separate the decimals, because here we just have two coordinates. The operations need to be done separately for each one of the coordinates. So the numerator of the first fraction is minus one fifth and I divide it by two. The numerator of the second fraction is seven over three and I divide it by two. And the final answer is minus one tenth comma seven over six. Now, I want to point out before I finish with exercise six, a common mistake on the square roots. So the first formula, the distance formula involved the square root of the sum of two squares. We had parentheses there, but it could have been two variables, variable A and variable B. And we had the, the sum of the square of those variables under the square root. It is a common misconception and it is not correct to simplify and distribute the square root in each of the summers. This does not happen. The misconception comes from the fact that we can distribute the square root when we have a product. In that case, indeed, the square root goes to each term of the product. This is correct. This is a common misconception. And I'm going to point it out to avoid future mistakes. Now on exercise eight. For this one, we are given three points and we are asked if those points form a right triangle. In order to judge if those three points form a right triangle, we will need to use the Pythagorean theorem. This exercise has many steps and I will go over it step by step. The first, step, it is to calculate the distance between each pair of points. So calculate the distance between X and Y, the distance between Y and Z, and the distance between X and Z. Let's start by doing that. So the distance between X and Y will be equal with the formula that we used earlier. The difference of the X coordinates of, X, of the point X and Y, so one minus four squared, plus the difference of the y-coordinates of those points, 
3 minus 5 squared under a square root. This gives us 3 squared plus 2 squared, which is 9 plus 4, so 13 under the square root. Now, notice I immediately here, even though I have 1 minus 4, which gives me minus 3, I ignore that minus because it is under a square. When you have a negative number under an even power, we just ignore the minus. It gives us back the same result as if the number was positive. So here, the square of minus 3 it is the same as the square of 3. And that's why I simplified my notation by omitting it. Now the distance between y and z is equal with the square root of 4 minus 7 squared plus 5 minus 11 squared. This gives us 3 squared again plus 6 squared. 3 squared is 9. 6 squared is 36, 9 plus 36 gives us 45. Now the last pair of points is the xz. The distance of those two points can be calculated by the formula square root of 7 minus 1 squared plus 11 minus 3 squared. This is equal with 6 squared plus 8 squared. And th this gives us square root of 100. We can simplify it to 10, but we don't necessarily need to. Again, we only are asked to verify if those three points are creating a right triangle or not. Those distances are not part of our answers. We can leave them as little simplified as we want. They won't affect our final answer. It's just the process to get there. And they provide adequate show of work since you appear to have done the, full, the calculations here. The simplification is just to make your answer easier to be graded. But this is not the part that is graded. This is just the part that you show work. Now, the second step after we calculate the distances is the following. We need to see if those three distances, the sides of the set triangle, are satisfying the Pythagorean theorem. So the Pythagorean theorem is the following, that the adjacent side to an angle uh, plus the square of the opposite side to an angle is equal with the hypotenusa, all of them in squares. Now, the hypotenusa in a right triangle, it is always the largest side. So among those distances, among those square roots, the only candidate for the hypotenusa, should we have a right triangle, will be the square root of 100. Any other we will, will not do because it is not the largest among the three. So here we need to verify if this equality holds. Now, it doesn't matter which one we pick as the A or the O in the equation. The sum is symmetric. So if you pick A is equal to square root of 13, or if you pick A is equal to square root of 45, as long as you pick for O the other one, this should still work. So we do not know if this is an equality, so I'm going to put a question mark on top of the equality symbol. Here we'll have square root of 100 squared. And here for me, I'll pick A to be square root of 13 and O to be square root of 45. Now, remember that if I have square root of a number and then I square this, I just get the number back as long as my number was positive and it was able to be under a square root. So this equation now transforms to 13 plus 45 equals with a question mark because we still have not yet verified this with 100. Well. 45 plus 13 gives us 58, and this is not equal with 100. 
hence neither are the previous equalities, hence the Pythagorean theorem does not hold for our points, and this is not a right triangle. Not a right triangle. And this completes exercise A. Now, for exercise 10, we have to graph the relations. Same goes for exercise 12. So we'll be working on them kind of in parallel. So the first one, exercise 10, it gives us the relation x comma minus 3 bar 0, smaller or equal than x, smaller than 5. So the first thing to do when we have to graph something, it is create a plane, an x, y axis. X is usually the left to right, and Y the up and down axis. Now we start to graph this by putting any information we have down. So here the points of interest are the following. We have the zero and the five that are bounding X. So I will put those down marked in the X axis. So we have the zero and the five for the x-axis. And even though y is not explicitly mentioned, we see that the second coordinate of the point given, x comma minus three, we have that the second coordinate is fixed. That implies that y will always be equal with minus three. So let's put it down here. Immediately, since y is forced to always be equal with minus three, we are restricting our graph to the line that passes on minus three, parallel to the x-axis, to the line that is of height minus three. Now, the second part after the vertical line gives us the restrictions for x. We are forced here to be between x is equal than zero and smaller than five. That includes zero, but not five, because we do not have smaller n equal than five. Now, on a graph, when we want to notate a point that it is included and it is an end point of our interval, we mark it with a solid circle. So I'm going to put the 0, comma, minus 3 with a solid circle and the 5, comma, minus 3 with an empty circle because this is not included. X cannot reach the value 5. It is always smaller than. Now, we have no restriction for between 0 and 5, so we connect them with a solid line to indicate that those points are all included. And that is for the graph of the relation x, comma, minus 3, where x is restricted between 0, and we include 0, and 5, but we do not include 5. Now, on, on problem 12, we have to graph the relationship x comma y, where now we have that y is smaller or equal than five. Notice here that we have no restriction for x, nor the coordinate of x is fixed as we had in the previous case. That implies that x will take any value possible. In those graphs where we have one of the two variables that can take any value possible with no restrictions, we end up with a graph that is a two-dimensional one. Previously, that we had restriction for both x and y, we just have a line, which is a one-dimension graph. Now here that we'll have a two-dimension graph, it is something that has an area, a positive area something that will look like a part of the plane, not just a slice of the plane. Now, as previously, I'll start marking down the points of interest. Here we have that y is bounded by 5. y is smaller or equal than 5. So I hit 5. I will draw out a dotted line as before. Now, because y it is allowed to include 5, it is smaller or equal, not like x was before strictly smaller, I will write down that line fully and not just a dotted one. 
And I have no restrictions for x, so this line extends from minus infinity to plus infinity as far as the left-right axis go. Now, I only include points that have coordinate of y smaller or equal than 5. That is, any point below my line. So the graph here involves any part that is below that line. That is what I mentioned earlier, that we expect that it, be, it is a big part of the plane. It is something that has two dimensions. It has an up and down and a left and right compared to the line earlier that can only move left and right and it has no way to go up and down. Let's proceed with the next two homework, 14 and 16. We're given relations again and we are asked to check if they represent a function. For a relation, after we graph it in order to represent a function, it has to pass the vertical line test. That is, that any vertical line drawing the x, x, y axis should only pass through one point at most from the points of the relation. So let's start with the first set, which, is, uh, which are the points 1, 3, 2, 3, 3, 7, and 4, 7, and graph them in the x, y axis. So we have the x coordinate 1, 2, 3, and four, and the y coordinates three and seven. Now the points as mentioned, it is the point one, three, two, three, three, seven, and four, seven. We see here that any vertical line we can possibly draw can only pass from one point, hence this relation does represent a function. It passes the vertical line test. For 14, we are given the points 1, 6, 2, 4, 1, 4, 2, 10. So we have the coordinate for x1 and 2, while for the y we have 4, 6, and 10. Now the point is 1, 6. 2, 4, 1, 4, and 2, 10. So here we see there are two possible vertical lines that pass from more than one points. The vertical line at x is equal with 1 does pass from two points, and so does the vertical line at x is equal with 2. So in both cases, the relation fails the vertical line test. And hence, this does not represent a, a function. In the same spirit, exercise 18 and 20 are give gives us some relationships between y and x and asks us if y is a function of x. For that to happen, similarly with the previous exercise, we will need to pass the vertical line test. But here it'd be way harder to graph it. So a way to understand this is that the vertical line test in a graph shows us that a given value of x corresponds to two values of y. So if we can determine by altering those expressions here, if a set x only corresponds to one y, then we can do the vertical line test without actually graphing. So for the first one, 418, the way to try to understand if this would pass the vertical line test, it is to try to solve for y. Bring it into the form y is equal with an expression, not y squared that we have right here. So in order to get rid of the square, I need to take square roots of both sides. And because I have square root of y square, I need a plus minus the square root of x, plus 6. Now, I've solved for y. How can I see if a set value for x will correspond to more than 1? Well, the main indicator here, it is this plus minus. This will tell us, tell us that if the square root comes out as a number, and that number is not 0, then I'll have both its positive and its negative. If the square root, for example, comes out as 1, 
then I get plus one and minus one. I get two values for y. So if I try to plug in a number, anything that does not make the argument of the square root zero, we don't want zero because plus and minus zero is the same thing. So that will not help us determine. Say that we plug in one, for x is equal one, we get square root of x plus six is equal with seven, square root of seven. And hence y will be equal with plus and minus square root of seven. Hence y has two values. And immediately we have that if we were to graph it at the vertical line x is equal with one, we would be passing through two points of the relation and hence there is a relation, it's not a function. Y is not a function of X. Let's see if that also happened on exercise 20. Again, the first step here, it is to solve for Y. So I'm gonna start subtracting and adding things until I'm left with just Y on the left-hand side. So the first thing I'm going to do, it is subtract X from both sides, minus eight X to be accurate because I have a coefficient on X. And we are left with minus y is equal with 14 minus 8x. Remember, I want to bring it into the form y is equal with something. So we need to get rid of the minus in front of y. To get rid of a minus, we need to multiply everything with minus 1. What min the multiplication with minus 1, uh, an easy way to remember it, it is you flip all the signs. So the minus y will become y. The 14 will become minus 14 and the minus x will become plus. Now, let's see if this is indeed something that would pass the vertical line test. Yeah, is this a function? It is indeed, and the reasoning is the following. Assuming we plug in a value for x, then when we multiply this set value with eight, we still have only one option. And when we subtract something from that result, from that option, we still have something unique. We cannot subtract from 14 from a number and then have two numbers, nor can we multiply a number by eight and then have two numbers as the result. In contrast to the previous one where we had plus and minus the square root. Generally, as a rule of the thumb is that if you are given a linear equation, that is an equation with X and Y and no exponent on X and Y, this will represent a function because this will later see that it represents a line with some slope. And any line can only be intersected once by any other line. So can only be intersected once by any vertical line. And hence it passes the vertical line test. Let's proceed with exercise 22. For exercise 22, we are given a function, which we notate with C of X, since it is a cost function of producing X albums. And it is given to us as the formula 40 times X plus 1500. For this exercise, we are asked to calculate and interpret C of zero and C of 25. Let's start with the calculation, which is the easiest part. When we have C of zero instead of C of X, what we do is on the formula, instead of X, we plug in the value that we have. In this case, zero. So the formula for our calculation, it will become 40 times zero plus 1500. Anything times zero is zero. So that is zero plus 1500. And zero does not affect our addition, so we have 1,500. Now, what does that mean? The cost of producing zero albums, that is, since X represented the number of albums and we had X is equal to zero since we calculated C of zero. That is the fixed cost of producing. Imagine having to run the factory and still having the fixed cost of the utilities and the employee's salary. Even though nothing might be produced you one day, they still have those expenses to pay at the factory. Now, let's calculate and interpret C of 25. That will be instead of X, I'll plug in 25, so it'll be 40 times 25 plus 1500. 
So we get 1,000 plus 1,500, which is 2,500. Now for this one, to interpret it, it is the cost to produce exactly 25 albums. It does also include, obviously, we see from this addition, the fixed cost. So the first one, it is the fixed cost. It is the cost regardless of how many we produce. And the second one, it is the cost to produce exactly 25 albums. Not the extra cost of producing the 25 albums. It is the total cost of a day that a said um, enterprise produced exactly 25 albums plus whatever cost it had as a fixed cost. Now let's proceed with the last homework. For this one, we are given the formula for the area of a circle of radius r, that is a of r, the area of a circle of radius r, is equal with pi r squared. So as a reminder here, even though you are allowed to use calculators, you are not obliged to simplify something like pi here. You can leave it as five pi, if that is your answer. You are not expected to plug in five times pi in your calculator and lose time doing that calculation. Any number like those, pi e, or later on the logarithms, that cannot be immediately simplified, they are some constants that have a set value, and only with a calculator you can, calculate, you can express them with decimals, can remain in your expressions exactly like that. Now, with that said, let's proceed with the exercise. We are, say, we are told that using a compass, a student wants to draw a circle on a 10 by 12 piece of paper and eventually cut out the circle. Moreover, the circle must be centered on the paper. That is, so the edge of the circle must still be within or at the edge of the paper in order to be able to cut out a full circle. So we are told that that is a 10 by 12 paper. And the questions are the following. What are the restrictions of R if the student wants to avoid hitting the edge of the paper? In other words, what is the domain of the function A R? And second, what is the range of R? How big can the area of the circle be? Okay, so let's start tackling the problem by thinking the following. What would be the optimal position for the center of the circle so we can expand our circle as much as possible? If we go too close to a corner or an edge and we try to draw a circle, we see that immediately as we try to expand out of the circle, we hit the edges too fast. And if we have gone farther away from the edge, we could have increased the circle. In other words, if we try to pull, because the circle expands evenly in all sides, the optimal positioning would be the center of the paper. Now the paper is not square, so we can go a little bit up or down on the larger side, but it won't change our results. So we'll go to the exact center of the paper. So, now, how much can our circle expand out? Well, the farthest away it can expand out from the center, it is half the smaller side's length. Because since we are in the center, in order to hit this edge over here, we can only go as much as half the length of the side. So it can go up to five. The radius of the circle can be up to five. So R for the domain must be smaller or equal than five. Now, do we have any restrictions from below? How small can R be? Obviously a circle cannot have a negative radius, but a point is considered a circle with zero radius. So we have R is greater or equal than zero. And hence we have part A, the domain or the numbers that are allowed R to take 
is any number between and including zero and five. Now for the range. The range is what values does the function take for any input. Now in this instance, in order to understand how to calculate that, first need to realize that the bigger the circle, the bigger the area. So the smallest value for the function AR, it is the value at zero because this is the smallest radius we can take. So let's calculate it. A at zero will be pi times zero squared, which is pi times zero because zero times zero is equal with zero, which is zero. And the biggest value that the function can take, it is the value of the circle with the biggest radius, which will be pi times five squared, which is equal with 25, so we have 25 pi. Hence the range of the function is the following. Include 0, 0,25 pi, including both. This will be all for today.